The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> I just started recording. Um, so yeah, I... these... oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that. Oh. Well. Yeah. So go ahead and keep well, talking. You can edit out the front of it. Yeah. Dan, I just. I... Yeah, just before you go, Dan, I have a question for you as far as, you know, especially when it comes to conventional, if you're using these systemic insecticides, what are your thoughts on using foliar versus soil treatments? Well, the issue with like that when is... When should you do it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, there's... Uh, the issue with that has been mainly cost. Um, um, there can be quite a bit more expensive to use a soil treatment for anything. So generally, I have suggested people go with foliar applications. Is that just because you're using more material? Um, and you'd be using a higher, pro probably a higher rate per acre, definitely. To, and uh, yeah, yeah. And you have to have some special application equipment in order mm -hmm. to do that, or the, or the right setup to be able to apply in the soil. Most everybody's got a sprayer. A lot of people don't have uh, something that applies in the furrow or however it's used. Um, uh, so I, I tend to favor the foliars because of the cost, and I think that's how most people are able to apply them. The issue has been mainly with um, Brussels sprouts, and especially for organic growers who don't have so many options, um, and I think we're still trying to figure out what those might be for them. Mm -hmm. um, conventional growers have many more options, and they can be effective. The issue probably is more getting in early enough um, or detecting the problem, you know, when cabbage aphids are getting in there early enough. Um, because with Brussels sprouts, they get in behind the little heads underneath uh, in the back, and then you just can't get a control at that at that point. So, and the problem we tend to see is more later in the season, not early on. Although we've seen cabbage aphids, you know, doing just fine in July. Um, so, um, I guess I. I would advocate more scouting and looking uh, to try to find early cabbage aphid arrival in a field and then plan treatments based upon that. If you're an organic grower, um, I'm still not sure exactly what's going to be most effective, but tank mixing um, a horticultural oil with an insecticidal soap rather than using either one alone. And I think Becky's been working on some of that too, can probably speak to that as well. Right. Okay. And getting good coverage with anything. I mean, you're you upping the gallonage, um, uh, making sure you've got targeted sprays um, that are getting the wetting where you need it, including an adjuvant if you need to, to, to make sure you get good wetting. Those might, those would all be things you'd probably want to do to help coverage uh, to be as good as possible. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead. Um, just the rest of us, uh, and we'll do it just the mm -hmm. same as as last time, and we'll pretend that there's lots of okay. people okay. watching. And mm -hmm. so, um, Anna, you're all, right. all set there. Oh. And um, before before we start, is there, anybody, is there anybody else that needs to sign off early and wants to add in anything, or is everybody else going to stick around until the end? I was just going to say you did a good job last time, Anna. So yeah. Say exactly everything you oh, said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, wish me luck. All right, here I go. Well, um, um, um uh, Anna, can you um just remind me? Uh, is there a slide before this that has like? Okay, yeah. I guess we should start with that. Yes. Um. Okay, go ahead. And then you're going to go through the polls, and we'll do that again, do you, do and I'll pretend. I mean, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm talk about them. Do you want to pretend that we actually are doing them? Or are, um, we, are we not going to – are we going to keep up the charade? <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. I can, well, this, uh, well, we could – I'll just go – I'll go over the questions, and you can maybe say in general what they look like. Yeah, I can say this, the response, what we – got from the because I wrote down what the answers were and so that might be interesting to include okay okay so we'll we'll go through them in a sort of half way okay thanks for doing this guys I'm real sorry about that and I'm 100% sure that today's webinar was recorded so hopefully that was a once and only 
mistake. Um, all right, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Friday lunch seminar series on Brassica insect pests. This is part of a project that's funded by Northeast SARE, a research and extension grant that uh, brings together extension researchers from New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts. Um, so just a few technical notes on today's webinar. Um, all the participants will be muted, but you can submit questions at any time via the questions box, which is on the right hand panel. And today's presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website soon. So today's workshop is going to be on cabbage aphid and Anna Wallingford from UNH will be presenting. Um, so take it away, Anna. Thank you, Sue. Um, here we go. All right. Um, I am Anna Wallingford. I'm an entomologist um, at UNH Cooperative Extension. Full disclosure, the majority of the data and the results that I'm presenting to you have been collected by other members of the Brassica Pest Collaborative, either here in Durham by Becky Seidemann and her students, or um, at uh, other collaborating research farms. Um, so today we're going to do a really brief introduction to aphid biology, how to identify cabbage aphid, um, some of the best management practices that we can recommend to you right now, and a few important points from that research. So first of all, identifying cabbage aphid um, and distinguishing it from different aphids. And generally, um, aphids are uh, notoriously hard to distinguish from each other, but this um, species is a real standout because it has that white to matte gray appearance, which is actually a waxy protective coating that that aphid produces from glands in its body. So it provides it with some protection, um, and it also gives you a really good um, key in identifying it and, and distinguishing it from other aphids. Um, another key characteristic um, is that cabbage aphids just love new growth. So this is a key characteristic in its behavior, but it's also um, part of the reason it's such a diabolical pest um, that'll get inside the nooks and crannies of those new growth um, habits. And even if you cut into that um, Brussels sprout, um, you'll find that aphids have been feeding on, on plants as it's growing. Um, this preference for new growth can also cause blinding or um, loss of the flower in crops like broccoli that you're growing for a flower. Uh, and that's another setback from that feeding behavior. Some other species that you might encounter on brassica, green peach aphid is an example. Now these have a really broad host range, so you'll find green peach aphid on a ton of other plant species on your farm. Um, they're often bright green, but they will vary in color. So color maybe isn't the best way to identify these guys. Um, in general, they, um, they will not have that waxy covering. So that's the key characteristic to distinguish between you know, peach aphids and cabbage aphid. Um, another aphid that you might encounter on brassicas is a turnip aphid. They do have a kind of grayish appearance, but they aren't nearly as waxy as cabbage aphid. So you see a nice close up there. Uh, they also prefer feeding on older leaves and they're, um, they're a more rare species. So um, chances are pretty slim that this will be an insect that's causing you problems, but it might be something you encounter. All right, so a few comments about the life cycle of cabbage aphid. Um, now, aphid life cycles are, are really, really tricky. Um, something to keep in mind is that sexual reproduction only occurs in the autumn. They, they will mate and lay eggs, and those eggs are the life stage that are the most successful at overwintering. So they'll, weigh, they'll lay their eggs on wild and cultivated brassicas, so plants that are on your farm and plants that are surrounding your farm. Um, those eggs overwinter and hatch in the spring. So the females that hatch from those eggs produce the next populations. And those wingless females will feed on their host and reproduce 
asexually. They do not need to mate, they don't need to find a partner, and they will continue to reproduce um, until until you stop them. With <laughs> uh, So there's multiple generations. So in that life cycle, that B stage is what we're talking about. Um, the C stage is the, the stage that is responsible for dispersing these populations. And what happens is overcrowding or stress on their plant will um, lead these females to give birth to winged daughters. Um, so when it comes to predicting movement of aphids, it's really, really difficult to predict them because these wing forms are triggered by the host of the plant they're leaving rather than the plant that they're going to. Um, and it's also important to remember that those asexual females will continue to reproduce asexually as long as they have um, a warm enough climate to do so and food to eat. Um, so for example, here is a high tunnel um, in the dead of winter. And you can kind of see there's snow outside of that. If it's the dead of winter. Um, and if you take a really good look at these plants, you'll find um, there's these colonies of asexually reproducing cabbage aphid that are perfectly happy to keep on eating these plants because they have a protected um, mesoclimate there. Um, so some cultural practices that can help um, reduce pest pressure. Um, rotate fall and spring crops. Obviously, um, if there's aphids in your spring crop and you plant a fall crop there, they're gonna be there as well. Um, be aware that previous crop residues and wild mustards, mustards are sources of infestation, so they could be flying in from um, other places where you've grown brassicas, and they could be flying in from weeds like shepherd's purse, wild garlic, mustards, and things like that. Um, another practice that could fall under cultural practices is to maintain insectary plantings to support predators and parasitoids, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So what we really want you to focus on is this susceptible growth stage. So say in a summer crop, you've planted your little baby plants, be they brassica or cabbage uh, or Brussels sprouts or whatever. These are the, this is the time that you're really trying to pay attention to when aphids are entering. And what you're gonna be seeing is aphids flying in. So these are the alate versions. Actually, it's gonna be a whole bunch of them. Um, because they are not the strongest flyers. They tend to be blown in on, on stiff winds um, rather than coming in under their own volition. Um, so these are the times that you're really scouting and looking for the initial um, indications of insects. So another um, way to identify infestations could be um, yellowing or cupping that's caused by aphid feeding. So something that you may notice from a little bit farther away than leaning over and actually looking under the leaf, you would see that yellowing. And I would bet that you turn, if you turn that leaf over, you'd find cabbage aphids on the other side. So another key characteristic for scouting. Um, so while we're talking about scouting, just a poll, um, to, we're curious as to how often you scout for brassica pests. Uh, maybe you never scout for brassica pest if you have the time, uh, maybe at a specific growth stage. So when your plants are young, um, do you do it once a week for the life of the crop, once a month? So if you could take a minute to think about what you do. Sue, do you want to chime in with what that looks like? Yeah, so the results are pouring in, and it looks like the winner is 41% said once a week. 38% said, if I have time, 15% said at a specific growth stage, um, and 8 or 9% said they never scout. So a few uh, <laughs> brave, brave, honest folks. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, you know, there's, there's enough people uh, being honest and enough people who are, are spending some time um, looking for these bugs because that's the key to it. All right, while we're at it, let's ask another question because we're, we're curious as to what kinds of people are listening in. If you could take a minute to describe to us your chemical approach. Are you a conventional um, farmer, an organic farmer, or something in between that you're not certified organic, but you do prefer organically approved products? Okay, and the votes are coming in now. And we see 
58% uh, are not certified organic leaning, 30% uh, organic certified, and 12% conventional. And some folks commented that they grow both. Awesome, yeah. cool. Very interesting. All right, so um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about conventional chemical controls. Um, this is something that you should really, um, you know, consult your grower guide, uh, maybe consult with um, one of us entomologists if you're interested in trying something new. A couple that I will point out, the ones that are the most effective are probably going to be um, products like Movento, or a sale. So the neonics are really the uh, industry standard because they um, they have some stomach um, activity. Um, another thing to keep in mind is products like Belief and Fulfill are selective, um, and they have been found to be pretty effective at controlling cabbage aphids, and they should not um, affect non-targets. So that's something to think about. Um, so since mo a lot of people are interested in organic options, I'll talk a little bit more about organic options, just some specific comments. Um, so products containing azadiractin, so azadiractin originally is from the neem tree, um, and it's extracted um, from neem oils in order to create these products. So azadiractin um, is an insect growth regulator, so it's not toxic to adults. It's really only going to stop the development of insects. Um, so as populations grow, um, the presence of this product should slow that down or stop it. Um, so it's not toxic, just slows the growth of a population. Oils and soaps, um, even though they are applied like chemical controls, I really like to describe these products as more of a physical control, um, that they have to actually coat the insect themselves. Um, so it would either smother the insect, like drown them, or um, coat the insect's outer epidermis and interfere with that epidermis to a point where it makes them uncomfortable or kills them. So another thing to go back to that waxy coating that cabbage aphid is so famous for is it also protects it from um, oils and soap. So if you're having a hard time using um, an oil or soap that usually works with other species of aphids, it may not be as effective for cabbage aphid for that reason. Um, pyrethrins are the, um, or pyganic is the trade name for pyrethrins. Um, they are neurotoxins that are, that can be effective for aphids. Um, one thing I will say is they're very photosensitive. So they um, will degrade quickly when exposed to UV light. So that's why we often recommend um, nighttime applications so that there's not a lot of UV light degrading these materials. Um, they'll be more efficacious. Um, Grandivo and Mycotrol are examples of biopesticides. So these are uh, biopesticides that are formulated in a way that they can be applied like a chemical pesticide, so um, it's easy to apply. But do keep in mind that biopesticide efficacy can be impacted by abiotic conditions. So um, if it's wet or dry, things like that might explain why a biopesticide may not have worked for you in the past. Um, we will talk about a product named Azera. That's a combination product that has azadiractin and pyrethrins in it. So we'll talk about that more. <coughs> so um, a couple things about best practices for chemical control, no matter no matter what you're doing, conventional or organic. Um, monitor and act early. Repeat those applications if you're using contact materials. Um, and spray coverage is really critical, especially with brassica crops, which are uh, the leaves are very waxy themselves, to have a spreader stri sticker, a wetting agent that um, doesn't create those water droplets to beat up and just roll off the plant. If you have a spreader sticker, um, it'll let that um, material cover the leaf surf surface more uniformly and may even get into those cracks and crevices where the aphids like to feed. Um, there are some other things that we could recommend as plants get larger, like drop nozzles or um, looking at your spray tips. We could definitely talk about that later. Um, a couple of research updates. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about insecticide efficacy trials conducted in 2016 and 2017. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that has been done by members of the collaborative, 
looking at aphid predators and parasitoids, but there's going to be much more to come from members at UConn, UMass, and UNH once um, you, we get a chance to make sense of the data. Uh, I will say 2018 was not an outbreak year for cabbage aphid, aphid in several areas. Um, some areas were definitely affected, but we in Durham did not see a lot of cabbage aphid in 2018. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. Um, so for example, here's an efficacy trial um, in Durham in 2016 where Brussels sprouts um, were scouted weekly and any time that um, scouting found aphids that surpassed uh, threshold, um, Azera or Impede was used in rotation and um, we found that's a that was a pretty uh, efficacious attempt there. <laughs> um, I will say that, that each of those dots probably indicates some kind of action, um, so there was probably a weekly application of something that year. So another example um, where um, each of these products was used whenever the population of aphids was surpassed. So, excuse me, that's spelled wrong. That's Azagard and New Film and Azera are both azadiractin containing products. Again, Azera is azadiractin and pyganic. Um, so you see the control and impede, which is a soap. Um, the aphid populations were large, and we see that there was some efficacy from those as a direct and containing products. So something to keep in mind. Um, oh, here's another efficacy trial from, and this was cabbage grown in Deerfield, Mass. Um, you'll see that red line at the bottom is actually the industry standard that we talked about. It's um, I think it's an imidacloprid or it's a neonicotinoid. We see that that um, controlled aphids at the beginning. And I'll point out the blue line at the top is the untreated control. So you'll see that all of these products, the sulfoil and the MP, which are oils, um, pyganic, um, as a direction containing materials, of course, they didn't come close to the industry standard in this situation, but they performed better than the control in some situations. So you're getting you're getting a little bit of control there. Again, the earlier, the better that you can get in with some of these things. Um, and here's uh, the data from Durham's trial in 2018. Like I said, 2018 was a weird year. Very few aphids. Um, we don't really have an explanation to why this was. We have a couple thoughts as to why it may have happened. Um, so it was a very wet, fall. We know that. Uh, it was definitely really wet in Durham. I know a lot of members of the collaborative found that we, they had wet conditions and had problems with diseases that caused problems in their crops. Um, but the weather, the rain, may have affected aphid invasion and establishment on those plants. Um, the wet conditions may have also made it really beneficial for entomopath intimate pathogens. So the fungi that attack and kill aphids may have just had a great season in 2018. Um, again, we're not really sure why this is, but these are some reasons that may have explained this. Um, a couple of thoughts about conserving natural enemies. So by conserving natural enemies, we're talking about things we can do to um, bring in predators and parasitoids that live in our farm and make it a favorable habitat for them. Um, general uh, thinking about conserving natural enemies is to tolerate low levels of infestation so that you're not using disruptive pesticides to kill those natural enemies. However, that may not be appropriate considering the risk or history of infestation in cabbage aphid um, because we really encourage you to act as soon as you see these insects um, flying in and infesting summer brassicas. Um, but you can use selective or short-lived materials to avoid non-target effects on predators and parasitoids. That's a good option. Um, and insectary plantings provide safe habitats. So obviously you're not spraying those insectary plantings with insecticides. And the pollen and nectar from insectary plantings are um, sources of food for predator adults. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, intercropping is one way, or borders around the crop. Something that we've been trying is refuges, so um, plots on the farm, one or more plots on the farm. So a couple of comments about predators. Um, so a generalist predator is lady beetle. Uh, um, lady beetles, uh, adults and larvae will eat aphids. Um, in general, a lady beetle, she will eat 
uh, cabbage aphid if she's given a cabbage aphid, but it, it's not her favorite. These cabbage aphids are pretty well defended both by that waxy surface and they also take in um, a little bit of the chemical that the plant uses for sex to protect itself. That's the glucosinolates. So uh, we, we also call them like uh, mustard oils. It's, it's what makes spicy mustard spicy, right? So it's um, like the spicier things like horseradish have high content of this glucosinolates. Um, all brassicas have a little bit of glucosinolate. It's meant to um, protect itself from um, insects, but these insects who have developed a uh, tolerance to glucosinolates, some of them also sequester that chemical for their own chemical defense. So you'll find that the predators that are um, taking advantage of cabbage aphid um, have also developed um, some kind of tolerance to that. So some predators are the larvae of aphylides and the larvae of hoverflies. So but the adults of those are both flies. Um, and then we have parasitoids, and there's a whole suite of parasitoids. Parasitoid is just a fancy type of predator that lives inside of its host. That oid means it's a parasite that kills its host. So for example, we have this um, wasp laying her egg inside a cabbage aphid, and then below it we see that aphid mummy that developed where the um, wasp baby developed into a new wasp and she has hatched out. Um, so you'll see aphid uh, mummies um, within those if they've been parasitized. So here's um, a picture of a pretty bad aphid infestation, um, and you'll see oh, right here, 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 there's some aphid mummies in that bottom one. You can even see the exit hole of the aphid mummy where that, that parasitoid wasp came out. Um, so there's definitely some parasitization going on here, but I wouldn't really say that this is um, doing a lot to keep the aphid populations below threshold. So this um, parasitoid is contributing, but may have been a little too late to help a lot in this situation. Um, so here's another nice picture. I really like this picture because you can see the aphid mothers and the little tiny ones are her daughters. So she's given birth to those um, uh, genetically identical daughters and they're gonna grow up to um, do the same. Um, but you'll see in this picture, um, those little orange thingies, those are the aphylides larvae. So um, a mother fly has come along, laid her eggs on this plant because she knew it was infested with aphids that her babies would like to eat. Um, and they've hatched out and they've become fantastic hunters and they're eating aphids there. All right, so some take home messages from our insectary work so far. Um, so the first question we're asking ourselves is like, are these common insectary plantings being used by aphid predators? And, and we, we feel pretty confident that they are being used. Um, the second question is a little bit harder to answer. Do these insectary plantings contribute to biocontrol of cabbage aphid? And this is a really, really difficult question to answer um, experimentally. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more. So first of all, some common insectary plants um, in general, insectary plants are, they usually have smaller flowers because these little insects, these are mostly hoverflies, there's a bee up in that corner, um, are smaller and they like to feed on the pollen, which is a great protein source, and then nectar, which is a great carbohydrate source. Um, so they will feed on the pollen and nectar of these plants um, and that will allow them to live a little bit longer. It'll allow them to produce a few more eggs and therefore would be able to produce more predators for cabbage aphids. Um, some of these plants can also be common cover crop plants. So buckwheat and clovers um, and things like that are, are pretty common in the landscape as well. Um, but these all provide um, good food resources for these um, predators. Uh, so here's an example of an experiment that was attempted in Becky's lab in 2016 where um, brassicas were planted either um, in combination with some of these flowering crops or without these flowering crops. So you'll see that the gray line shows the number of mummies that were found on brassica plants um, that were closer to flowers, and the blue line is indicated the mummies that are on brassica plants that are a little bit farther from flowers. So they're on the same farm, both of these um, treatments are getting a, you know, maybe getting a benefit from this um, flowering 
uh, resource. However, I mean, you can see that there's there's a higher rate of parasitism in the, the plants that are closer to flowers, and that um, increase may have happened a little bit earlier. So that you kind of see that's the trend is that the sooner you see an impact from a biocontrol, the better, um, in order to get in early and slow the rate of that that cabbage aphid population growth. Um, here's another example. Here's, our, here's aphilides larvae. Um, again, we can't really see how many aphids these larvae, uh, the lar these larvae have eaten, but we're, cons you know, we're assuming that they're eating cabbage aphids. Um, but you see that same uh, pattern here, probably a little bit stronger, where you see higher numbers of the predators in the crops that are associated with flowers, and that higher number happens a little bit earlier than in the control plots. So those are the things that we're looking for that show us that, that this is doing some good. Um, so in conclusion, um, know how to identify your aphid. So distinguishing cabbage aphid as being that white to gray matte appearance. Um, also the feeding behavior is a, is a dead ringer for cabbage aphid. Um, identify, identify the sources of your aphids, be they on farm or coming from, from somewhere else off farm. Scout early, act early, act often. A lot of these softer materials that are soft on non-targets will probably need to be applied pretty frequently, so keep that in mind. Um, use adjuvants when spraying insecticides and especially on brassica crops. Um, spreader stickers, wetters get really good coverage um, when it comes to brassica crops and especially for aphids who like to hide in cracks and crevices. Um, insectary plantings, now this is really going to be a personal uh, choice as far as whether or not to use insectary plantings. Um, they definitely do some good. Uh, it's hard to measure how much good they do, um, but we do know that biological control contributes to aphid control, be that entomopathogenic fungi that occur uh, naturally or the generalist and specialist predators that can also benefit from insectary plantings. So that, those are my um, final comments. I don't know if you want to um, open that up for questions now. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for that awesome presentation, Anna. And yeah, now we'll get started on the questions. There have been a lot coming through. So um, first off, you mentioned a few times that um, impacts of wa weather, uh, especially water, maybe drought versus wet conditions on cabbage aphids. And I wondered if you could say more specifically about that. Um, I could take this question. This is Alina. I would say that um, definitely on years, well, from what I have seen, on years that um, are more wet, the cabbage aphid haven't been more as prevalent. And then on years um, following crashes in populations from wet years, you may see less cabbage aphid populations since they had less to um, produced from from the year prior. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and I guess related to that was um, if there is uh, any indication that like just watering, overhead watering would would um, have any impact on um, on cabbage aphid populations. So this isn't something that we've tested yet, and we're considering maybe doing a pilot on pilot study this year. Um, but we do know that this entomopathogenic fungus is in the agro ecosystem already. Already, um, we know that there's many different strains and species of this fungus. So each ones may respond differently. They may have different environmental conditions that they thrive in. Um, the one, the entomopathogenic fungus that I have encountered on Brussels sprouts in 2017 and 18 appeared to be that they, um, that they responded, they uh, germinated and, uh, and attacked cabbage aphids in conditions that were more prone to high humidity and more um, higher temperatures in general. 
but I don't think that across the board, it always is like that. So it's important to identify species and um, know exactly what environmental conditions those are. Having said that, it's pretty hard to um, control those environmental conditions. You can't exactly control the humidity or the temperature. Uh, no, but it'd be nice if you could, huh? Um, well, can you give any other tips about how to identify the entomopathogenic fungus? I'm not sure I've ever seen it before. Yeah, so on, they could be on single aphids or they could be on densely, um, on mats of dense aphids. And depending on the fungus, I think they're going to look different to the naked eye, but it is something that you can, if you're looking closely, you can notice it with your naked eye. And it essentially appears to be fuzzy or moldy. Um, I've seen it look dark gray or orange in color. Um, and if it affects the aphids, it kind of connects them as a fuzzy blanket. And then left behind are the parasitized or mummy aphids that are not consumed by the fungus since they're essentially just empty shells. Um, so that that might be an indication that those aren't being affected, but other ones around are. Okay, cool. Um, maybe another question sort of related to the water was um, if there are, if there is excessive water, does that wash away some of the nitrogen? And then you have sort of, uh, is, there, is there an impact then on the cabbage aphid populations if you have either too little or too much nitrogen in the crop? Maybe Anna or um, Becky could chime in on this one. Yeah, this is Becky and I can chime in on this. Um, we've not done specific studies on this. In general, uh, there is a perception and it's been shown in certain circumstances that um, lush growth, excess nitrogen does favor many kinds of aphid pests. Whether this is true for cabbage aphid or not, we're not sure. Um, it is definitely true that because we've seen on some of our field edges some nitrogen starvation due to some fertilizer application problems. And it is definitely true that stressed nitrogen deficient plants still have significant cabbage aphid problems. So withholding nitrogen is not, uh, for aphid management is probably not good practice. Um, but we don't really have a, a, we don't have a lot of evidence saying that excess is going to necessarily promote cabbage aphid. Okay, thanks. Um, there are a couple questions about sort of overwintering. Um, are the eggs overwintering in the residues or in the soil and, and when do they emerge? And maybe a second sub question, um, are there winter conditions that might um, favor or damage um, uh, the or reduce the survival of the cabbage aphids in winter. And maybe Anna um, or Becky again could could chime in there. Uh, sure, I can chime in. Um, this is Becky. Um, so the references that are available suggest that the eggs hatch in April, but I'm not quite sure where geographically that comes from um, because April in the southern part of the United States is not the same as April in the northern part. So I think we can safely assume that the eggs hatch in spring, but adults can over and do overwinter as adults. Um, as long as the conditions are somewhat mild. And so we see this in high tunnels. We probably would see this also in low tunnels or other kinds of protected structures, wherever there are brassicas or brassica weeds. So if that's the case, cabbage aphid can actually be present year round. 
um, we could maybe target, probably should target our scouting efforts, assuming that those populations are really taking off um, in early, early summer. But as if there are brassica crops around, um, there are, it is possible for there to be cabbage aphid. Maybe you could re-ask if I could answer that question thoroughly. Oh no, I think that's uh, a good answer. And <laughs> does that does that answer your question? Can, can you hear me? Uh, uh, no, we we couldn't hear you before. Um, okay. But you seem to be back on. All right. If so you want to <laughs> add anything know. there, um, the the, no, other, the other comment was just that someone uh, wrote in that when deer or livestock graze the residues, the populations seem to be lower the next year. And um, if that would be a strategy that you would recommend, like destroying the residues. Well, that's definitely a good way to destroy the residues other than, you know, burying them, sure. Yeah, okay. destroying residues, I think, definitely would help. But even if you yourself have a completely clean farm and doing all the things that you think you should be doing, there definitely is, as Anna mentioned earlier, there's plenty of wild relatives and you don't know what necessarily what your neighbors are doing. And, um, and we're not really clear exactly how far cabbage aphids can travel on the wind and it potentially could be very far. Um, so do your best to reduce residues, but they still may be coming in from elsewhere. Okay, great. Um, let's see, there were a lot of questions about uh, the insectary work and biocontrol strategies. Um, so one question was, are there any commercially available um, predators or parasitoids that you know, like with uh, other systems like um, aphids and greenhouses, maybe you can buy in some of these things. Are those available for cabbage aphid and would you recommend that as a strategy? I will say that aphilides, so the little orange larvae that um, was identified in some of the field trials, you can purchase, a, there's a commercially available aphilides. Um, as far as recommending purchasing aphilides and releasing it, I, I would fall short of that. Um, it's definitely one of those things where you're re if you're releasing into a, a high tunnel, um, you maybe ha would have more luck keeping them there. Um, theoretically, if you have a flowering resource, you may have more luck keeping them where you want them to be. Um, however, if it's in an open field setting, there's nothing really keeping those insects there unless they really love to eat the aphids that you have there. Um, that being said, the aphilides that you're buying from an insectary may not be used to eating cabbage aphid. They may be used to eating something that's a little less chemically dependent than cabbage aphid. Um, we obviously see our aphilides in the field eating cabbage aphid, so we know that species loves to eat cabbage aphid. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that the adults of these species are the ones making the choices of where to leave their offspring and the offspring are doing the biocontrol. So the number one driver in that selection is that the aphids are present. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in, um, maybe Anna or Becky, as far as suggestions, as far as improving biocontrol. Okay, maybe maybe no more suggestions about that, but I, I would put a question to Becky. Maybe um, there was a question here about um, how to implement the insectary plantings and how close were um, the flowers to the crop in your study where you saw an effect? Well, in the study that directly compared flowers in plots versus not in plots, they were 
the flowers were embedded right in the middle of the plot. So they were, you know, within a foot of, or a couple feet of cabbage, of uh, Brussels sprouts on either side, um, whereas they weren't in the other plots. However, um, I don't think that embedding them may be necessary because in other experiments we had where we tried to look at the distance that of an, where the effects, uh, whether the effects would taper off over a large distance, we planted the insectary plantings at the far end of a field. And as far as a couple hundred feet away, we measured this roughly the same amount of predation and parasitism happening at the far end as right next to those insectary plants. So I think the jury is still out. Um, where insectary plants are used in uh, production uh, and in control of aphids in brassicas and lettuce crops in the Salinas Valley of California, they have found that the, the deployment, there are many deployment strategies that work, but the one that they've gone towards is inserting the insectary plantings sort of unobtrusively throughout the, the planting. Um, we don't know whether that's necessary or helpful, but our results sort of suggest that the beneficial insects go a long way. Okay, that's good to know. Um, another question for you was about the, the spray trial that you did with the Azera um, could you just say a little bit about um, if there's like a program that you would recommend um, based on that work and um, how often folks should be spraying? Sure. So um, let's see how often folks should be spraying should be determined based on whether there are live cabbage aphids there at threshold levels. Um, we don't have data suggesting what the right threshold levels are here. In California, they use a roughly 10, 12% threshold. In reality, probably when you detect aphids in your scouting, you are probably at that threshold. In our experiences, that was the case. Maybe one week you would identify them and you wouldn't be at threshold, but within a few days you would be. So in our experience, using organic materials, which are less likely to um, completely eradicate all aphids, once, a, once you hit threshold, you're probably going to be at threshold every week there on out. And so for us, it, in both cases where we were able to do those successful trials, it was weekly scouting and weekly applications of those materials until you know the end of the season, and so that meant um, seven or eight applications through the throughout the growing season. In a year when the weather conditions were not favorable, um, in some cases we just never hit threshold, or we might hit threshold but then fall below it again. Okay, that's regular, regular scouting will help you there because um, scouting is going to cost you less than spraying if you don't need to. Um, but just, yeah, be on top of the scouting because they can fly in throughout the, throughout the season. New, new, new winged aphids can fly in. Okay, great. Um, can you just remind us again what the materials were that you were using in that study? So in our first study, when we, were com when we had really good success controlling cabbage aphid, we were alternating back and forth between MPED and then Azera, which is an azadiractin pyrethrum mix. Um, and so we would do one week MPED and the next time we need it, we hit threshold, we would do a Zara and then we would, you know, swap back and forth. And we got quite good control with that. 
um, with that regime in that year. And then the subsequent year we compared, we, we rather than doing a mixture like that, rather than alternating, we isolated them apart and compared with a control MPED. And then Alina, was it AZA Direct or AZA Guard? It was AZA Guard and okay. AZA. I can never remember. And then Azera was the third one. So we really isolated out the Azadiractin product um, with still that combination product. Okay, great. That's good to know. And there was a comment here from a grower in Rhode Island that said when they scouted early, they would go out with a backpack loaded up with MPED. Um, and they had thought that really helped them keep on top of the population. Um, so I wanted to share that with everyone. Uh, absolutely, that's a really good, um, and another thing to keep in mind about Impede is it could also add some of the spreader sticker um, adjuvant activity that we've been talking about. So um, that could be something that could be tank mixed with any of the products we're talking about as well. Good point, good point. Let me, I'd like to add one other thing too, and something that we haven't really talked about or addressed in our research, and that is um, many growers rogue early on when they're scouting, rather than going around with a backpack sprayer, which is also an awesome idea, they go around with a bag. And they would actually, if you identify leaves with that are have a reasonable amount of cabbage aphid colonies, just bag them. They do arise from those single flown in winged aphids. And so I think you can gain yourself a couple of weeks um, less spraying if you aggressively rogue as you scout um, as well. We didn't do that in our research because we didn't want to sort of mess with things in that way. Um, but practically speaking, I think it can be very helpful. That is a good point and something I've noticed in my fields too is that they really do seem to get going on just a few spots in the field and um, if you remove those, you've really done yourself a big favor getting rid of those sort of um, founder populations. Um, so we've been talking a lot about some of the organic sprays. I wonder if anyone could comment on which uh, conventional materials have the greatest efficacy? Yeah, um, this is something that, that Dan Gilrain offered some advice on. Um, he definitely ranked some of the systemic materials as highest. So um, a sale is an example of a neonicotinoid. Um, and some of these neonicotinoids will vary um, as far as their av availability from state to state. Um, Movento was another highly rated one. Um, and belief was that um, it's, it's aphid specific, but that is also systemic and that it's translaminar. So it's one of those insecticides that will cross over the leaf um, and provide some some material to aphids feeding on the underside. So that's another big challenge with the fact that these aphids feed on the underside of the leaves. If you're just using a contact product, um, some of these systemic insecticides will reach insects feeding there. So belief is a good one. Um, Avento, SAL, Endeavor was another one. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, and that's actually the end of our question and answer period. So um, with that, unless anyone has any last comments to share. Uh, I'm good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anna, for a great presentation and to all the panelists for, for a good discussion. And I hope that folks are able to tune in next Friday for our uh, next webinar, which will be on caterpillar pests, and we'll be focusing on cabbage looper and diamondback moth. And that will be Dan Gilrain giving that seminar. So hope to see you then. Thanks. Thank you.